you construct, uh, this has adjustable stops on the, uh, on the uh, taper. This is, this is actually a table leg for that little table I showed you several slides back. I've made a number of these. And I, I made them on this exact jig. And uh, what you do on any taper, rather than on the plan, it'll say two degrees. Okay. Can you tell whether that's two degrees or not? <laughs> it's about two right. five. Yeah. When you look at a plan and it's got a degree mark on it, Go find another plan, <laughs> all right? Because what you're interested in when you taper a leg is where does the taper start, okay? If it says it starts five inches down from the top, measure that and that's your mark. Look at the bottom and find out how wide it is, okay? And make a mark there, okay? And you, you line it up like this. Take that mark on the uh, bottom and line it up where your blade is going to cut right there. And you take the line where you mark the taper to start right there and line it up there. And you, you clamp it down like this. Alright, and when you clamp that down, now it gives you the opportunity. This jig does, they're not all like this, but this jig does. You can slide these stops up here like this. They're adjustable. You can slide them up. And now what I have done is I have established my fence. All right, because the fence determines your relationship to the blade. Okay, now I have that clamped down and I can run through the saw and I can cut that tape. This gives me an opportunity to, to again criticize the shop because on this jig, how, how, how tight is it necessary to get these things here? Just kind of snug to where they hold yes, this down to the board and you can run it through the saw. Yeah. I have personally come in here and reattached this bar to this thing at least three times because people crank these down. I don't know whether they get a 12-inch pipe wrench or what they do. <laughs> but they tighten them down to where they pull this thing away from the sled. And that is just absolutely ridiculous. You <clears throat> snug them down to where they hold the board. And while I'm on that soapbox, I'll talk about the locking knobs on the table saw. Okay, when you tighten stuff down, you only need a quarter of a turn. You don't have to bring Tarzan back in here to undo it next time you want to uh, adjust it. So when you tighten locking knobs or Sorry. clamping knobs or any type of, type of knobs now, do not gorilla tighten them. It's unnecessary. You wear them out and you make the guy that follows you on the machine very put out with you. So, so on those, those cross pins that you're using for the are those just, are those bolts or are those round stops? Those are quarter inch aluminum. Quarter inch aluminum scrap that I salvaged well, somewhere. Pass around and look at it. Okay, I want to move on to the He's next moving. jig because, again, it's a taper jig, but it's a special taper jig because Two weeks ago when we had Nancy Hiller in here, part of the design of her project was this desk leg. Okay. All right. That is a rather tedious leg to make. And just to describe what's necessary here, you put this on the drill press and you drill through part way with a five inch force or with a five eighths inch force or bit, you turn it drill through, turn it, drill through, turn it, and drill through. And I had a example here somewhere. Okay, anyway, you can you can imagine that hole drill through. Well, the bottom of that hole is where your taper has to end. The taper started 10 inches up here, okay? That established 
this angle. All right. So now you put this in here like this, and and establish that angle. And when you saw down it, it saws this taper out of the way down to right here. We talked about stops. Why would you want to put a stop there? You don't, want to cut off the end. you don't want to cut off the end. It's very easy to cut off the, the end. And if you look on the sled, there's a lug right there. When it gets to the saw table, it stops right there. Except for some of you guys that want to lean real hard on it, it might go past that. But uh, you don't want to cut the end off, so you put a stop on it. Geez, and, out of the pardon, this is a bandsaw taper jig. So that uh, you can make a taper jig either for the table saw or the band saw. Now there was a related jig for that leg. These had to be paired up for that leg, which was this jig right here, a companion jig. And what this did was it reduced the face of this leg. Because if you look at this leg, it's one and three quarters square here on the bottom. But you have to saw an eighth of an inch off of each face of it because it's only one and a half inch square up here. Okay, so what you do is, I, and I've got a, a, a one or three quarter block here to show you this. We use this as a gauge, but what this jig does all right, if you put this in there, you see the overhang on it? It saws one eighth of an inch off. All right, if I rotate it like this, it saws an eighth of an inch off. If I rotate it once more, I've already cut an eighth of an inch off, so it will, it will not cut. And you have to use shims in here. All right, when you clamp it down, you put a shim in there to move it back over to cut off the right amount and to clamp the right amount, you have to put a shim on top. All right, if you rotate it once more, you need to put a shim on the bottom and the back and the top. But that in analyzing jigs, remember, you have to know where you want the blade to cut to establish your fence. Now, what do these shims do? They move your fence. Okay, so you established your fence on the first cut. It cut right on the second cut, but it's short on the third cut, so you have to use a shim to effectively move the fence over. And that's how you analyze the jig. Get in your mind, stepwise, what you want the jig to allow you to cut. Okay? I got your slide oh. Pardon? I got your slide show back. Are you sure? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see where we are then, Mike. Okay, Dave, I got a quick question. question. Yes. If you're cutting the outside off an eighth of an inch, why do you need the shim underneath? Because if the shim is not underneath, this protrudes up and tilts your board like that. Now, what the, you've already cut this space off okay. here, and you don't want to mess this up. And again, uh, <coughs> let's move forward, Mike, uh, because I'll show you the stop on this. Move one, one more, uh, one more. Uh, it was too that, bad. That shows you the jig that I was just telling you about. Now move one more. There is where we want because we want this. We want this cut to stop. All right, and we want it to stop right here and because of the circular configuration of the table saw we have to be very careful we want it where we want it to stop this is past the end of the table but you can put a stop block in the run out table in that slot and stop it there so uh, a lot of times on jigging you have to again move to an auxiliary stop to stop your cut Okay, let's go one more, Mike, and see where we are. Okay, drilling jigs. That's any any questions on sawing jigs? 
because uh, we've covered a lot of ground here, but you can see with the sled or the sled idea that you can figure to, you can configure to do a lot of things on yourself. Now we'll move to uh, drilling jigs because on, on a drill, particularly on a drill press, now you go from a, shall we say, a plain XY machine, so, so this way you position this way, on a drill, you can position this way and this way, and you've got a dimension this way. Okay, so you can set your drill depth, and you have to, uh, on a drill press, you have a fence that locates you back in front uh, from the uh, from the drill center, and a, a stop lock moves you from side to side on the drill press, and. Uh, Get this hit ready because we're going to talk about it. And uh, you want clamps on the drill for uh, safety. And it is very important that you clamp stuff down on the drill. Let's move one, Mike. Okay, this is a picture of, uh, actually this is a picture of Roger Bartlett. You can see on the drill press what he's doing here. He's, uh, he's got his, uh, he's back against the fence to locate his drill center and he's got a stop block on the right and he's clamped down to drill that. On my drill press at home, this is the jig that I clamped to my drill press table. And I think the next slide shows this jig on my dirty drill press. But what this jig does, it clamps on the drill press table. My drill is drilling about right here and I've got this movable clamp, I can clamp stuff down on my table. I've got stops that if I want to stop one way or the other, I can flip the stops down on my drill press. And this has handy lugs on the back to where I can just put it on the table and put a C-clamp on the table. And now I've got an adjustable fence on my drill press table with movable stops and with a portable clamp. Okay, if you have a drill press, that's a very good device uh, to have on your, your drill press. Uh, let's move on to uh, toy making jigs. Many of you are familiar with these toy making jigs that we, that we use here in the fall when we make the wooden toys, and at one time the guild made thousands of wooden toys on the, on the order of, uh, of these little these little trucks like this that uh, we we had we had scrap wood and we would make the, the little toys and in the fall uh, we we hold two glasses and make these little toys and we have a number of jigs we use and those are Durable. Straight. So, <laughs> that's why my jigs are all straight. Uh, and we can go on to the next slide. I think it shows the toy making. Uh, okay. Yeah, I don't want to comment much on those. We'll come back to that. We'll go to the next one, Mark. No, back up. Okay, I'm sorry. There you go. There, that's all right. What you noted on, on, what you noted on that picture of the little trucks and the, the little trains, you notice on the little trucks that the window hole is always the same one, the same place on them, whether it's a trailer truck or a box truck or whatever. This jig here sets you in here and you can establish where you want the window. You can either drill it there or if it's a different model of truck, you got a trip stop, you can drill down to there. And uh, this allows you to have a variable stop position on drilling the window <coughs> holes. This is exactly the same on the axle holes on the truck. And uh, this was Norman's idea. He, he's got marked on here what model truck you're making you want to uh, use which flip stop. So we got them named, labeled A, B, C, and D, and uh, it makes the jig kind of foolproof. And that's a, uh, that's a toy drilling jig. 
some of the other jigs we use on toys are uh, what happened to my video? Uh, okay, go to that one right there. You see right there, the uh, the toys are made. Dang, I got too much stuff up here, guys. The, the toys are made on a a base right here. The toy train. You start out with square bases and the toy train is made with these bases that hook together and if I can find my bases, there they are, right there. The train starts out with blocks like this, except they're square on the ends. Alright, I got, you can use a stop block on the table saw and you can saw, these are six inches long, one and a half inches wide, three quarters of an inch thick, you can saw a whole lot of these. About two years ago, for a Head Start School, we made 250 trains. 250 trains, there's five of these on each train. All right, so again, that's a whole bunch, according to Dennis the Menace. And there's a number of ways you can get these little things rounded here. All right, and uh, one way is to uh, go over to the sander and grind them around. Or you can saw them with a the table saw and gently sand them off and make them round. But the way we do it in order to speed up production is we stack, <coughs> we stack 20 of these blocks in this jig right here, all right, and clamp them down and we take a three quarter inch round over router all right and we run we run this jig with 20 of them this way and turn around and run them this way and flip them upside down and run them this way and just pretty quickly we can make several hundred of these and we can uniformly round the ends that is a profile jig that allows you to stack multiple points uh, multiple parts in and do the same operation on the protruding edge of all of the uh, jigs. We do exactly the same thing on the on the little truck beds. On these little trucks, part of the little truck is a is a little bed that fits right on here. This is actually the wrong truck block, but there's a little bed that fits right on here. And you notice that the corners of these are rounded off. Again, you can go over to the sounder and the sander and individually round those off. Or you can stack 20 or 25 of them in here and you can clamp them down. There's a T-nut and there should be a nut right there. And you can run this down the router that side and run it down the router this side. And you can round over a whole bunch of them at, at one time. Just just like that. So that's a profile routing jig for the toy trucks. And we have drilling jigs for the little train cars and uh, so that uh, that goes rather uh, rapidly when we're making toys. That, unless you got a question, is the toy making jigs. And let's move down to router jigs, Mike. You see that? On the little desk, we, little desk we made a couple of weeks ago, there was a piece on the little desk underneath the top, underneath the top and by the, the side of the leg. In fact, it, had, it glued, glued onto the side of the leg like this. And it was a, it was a piece that is it, kind of decorative. There's no function to it all, but it's an arts and crafts accent on, on that little leg and the test was to make four of these for each disc. Four times 13 is what? 52. All right, we had to make 52 of these things. We had 13 students. We could have told the 13 students, okay, you're on your own to make you four of these. Okay, and, and it would have turned out all right. They would have marked them according to the pattern that we had. They would have gone over and band sawed them and probably gotten on a spindle sander and smoothed them up. 
okay? But jig-wise, if you make your little thing like this, and this is called the Hiller Desk Corbel Routing Jig, now I've done several things here. What, what does the fence do? It establishes your relation to the cut line. What's the cut line on a router? The edge of the bit. The point to the bit. So this is the fence, right? That is the fence, but we also have to locate this in a proper attitude. So we've got three more fences back here. All right, if our first operation, we will take our, our blank like this, take our blank like this, first operation, and put it in here. And I need to loosen my screw. Put it in here and, and take a pencil and mark right there. If I go over to the bandsaw and I put that waist out about maybe an eighth of an inch outside that line, all right, and put this back in here, and I go over to the router. Uh, should I have a picture of the router there, Mike? Uh, right there. Go over to the router with this. You note that on my jig, I have noted the direction of travel. Now I can go up, I can set this on the router, and I can take the pattern cutting bit, which is uh, right here. In case you've never used one of these, these things are super. This is a white side compression pattern cutting bit. We have two of them here in the shop, and those cut very, very clean and uh, they will grab but they don't grab as badly as a straight bit and when you get that finished cut made it looks just like this if you want to pass those around and look at them all right we have the same operation on a little apron face for the front of the desk and it was cut like this on the bottom, exactly the same jig. We have just redefined the fence line. Okay, so that is uh, that kind of a router jig. Uh, let's go to Andre's uh, table leg right there. Okay. Many of you know about the Andre's project that we did years ago to get the money to build our shops. But this table here, uh, that routing principle is the exact same routing principle we, need, we use to make all of those table legs. And the pattern for that actually fit over the blank and had clamps on the end, screwed it down, and we guided that entire edge on both sides by the router bit cut that shape. We also did the uh, the uh, hearts in the, the benches like that. So you can see by pattern routing and making the jig sport, you can do a lot of, uh, of uh, curved work and fancy work that you can't, can't do on a, on a saw and even a band saw. If you did that very carefully, you'd still have a lot of smoothing up to do. And we made, I think all told, for Andre's, we made about 30 tables, and <coughs> we had to make 60 of those pieces of, of wood, and it would have been a lot of work on a band saw and smoothing up. We, we made them not very quickly, but we made them consistently in the same way by using this pattern routing technique. Now, I want to draw your attention to, see this? See that little pin right there? There's two of those in each table. Now, if you have to make some of these, how, how would you make them? All right. Anybody got any ideas? You can, you can, set, the, you can set that down on the, on, the, on the bandsaw, and very carefully you can make that cut right there, and, and you can kind of angle it, and then you'd have to smooth this up, and then come back and saw this around. And, uh, for, I, Anybody got any ideas on how to make that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Use a 
using a router jig. Let's put on CNC machine, cut out as many as you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Basically, did you make a long piece and then cut off? No. <laughs> Dave, do you have a jig for that? Do I have a jig for that? Boy, do I have a jig for that. What you do is, you start out with pieces like this. Okay. This happens to be what you need to make that little thing right there. If you take your two pieces and the appropriate jig, you can put your first piece in here. Now you play like this saw cut is not there, but you put the piece in there and you run it down the saw. And when it comes back, when it no, I don't want to answer that. <laughs> when it comes back, you have this cut made. And if you move that up to here, it sets it in an angle and you put a new piece in there. And when you pull it out now, you have the straight cut and the angle cut made. All you need to do is go over to the bandsaw and saw around there, that profile, and you have this little pin made, okay? You have to answer this phone, guys. The, uh, she says you better get them quick. The uh, and milk. And milk. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm sorry for the interruption. When you cut the so jigsaw, do it. Yes. Did you first cut it out with the jigsaw? You we cut it out with an inch and an eighth force in the bit. Drill the starting hole. Drill the ears. Then we came. So how did you deal with the waste when you finally yeah. cut through with the router? You don't have a piece flying around or anything. No. You look at you look at this router bit. If you look at this router bit. It doesn't leave any small pieces. <laughs> wow. The, uh, it spits out sawdust. It spits out sawdust. The, the, uh, so anyway, anyway, that that's how you make those those little pins there. Let me see what uh, that was. The Andre's uh, pin pin jig. Uh, I did. Pull out the jig. Says, has anyone ever uh, seen Gary Milky make the trophy flex for All Star Trophy? Mm. Have uh, I, I'm going to skip that in, in view of the time. But Gary does a a, a uh, operation that we worked out called pattern sewing, and you can take the shape of the the trophy flag, and it's got. I've got steel pins in that. You can lay it down on the blank and then put an auxiliary fence on the table saw and you can make that trapezoidal cut on the table saw just without any positioning at all. You just pull the pattern. But, uh, I don't want to get that out because I've got a couple of other things that are going to take some time to uh, show you here. And what I want to do is go to Paper legs. Special jigs. Uh, yeah, I want to go to the eight-sided tapered legs because this was the Andres project, again part of the Andres project, and we made 70 chairs. 70 chairs times four legs times eight cuts per leg plus turning a tenon on them. Anybody want to make some legs? Yeah. But, uh, anybody want to make some legs? This is this is a rather tedious operation unless you know how to do it. And if you know how to do it, it's very simple. Now, let's analyze this. The first thing we had to do is put this on a lathe and turn this tenon. That's rather straightforward lathe work. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, since we put it on a lathe, we had to drill a center hole in either end of it to suspend it on the lathe to turn this. <clears throat> and now we have to establish the taper on it. So it would make reasonable sense if we put a 
a pin in that end and then move this pin over here a certain amount to establish this paper. Now, let me show you how we did that. Do I, do I have a jig for that, Mike? Yeah. I've got a jig for that. They have to move your mic a little bit. Keep rubbing against your shirt. You don't get so much feedback. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. 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 Just standing. Don't move. When you every, move. Time, every time. Every time. Okay. What we did on this is there's a pivot back here on this jig. And there's a pivot up here on this jig. And we can take this piece and we can put it on that pivot. And we can screw this pivot down and we have established our taper line on this. All right, we've established our taper line and we have the leg established to solve the right taper on it. What's the problem at this point? Turning it. Indexing. Sawing them all. Indexing. Now remember, indexing. I said you had to worry about indexing on some mm -hmm. operations. Now, this is this is going to tax your mind. <laughs> this is going to tax your mind, and we're going to do it. Let me. Let me get the thing here. If we start out with a square like this and it's suspended right there and we've got the right taper on it by just moving around and registering to the bottom or to the side we can we can saw those faces off right all right so now we've got a four-sided tapered leg now, the only trick now is to get this four-sided tapered leg eight-sided. And the way you do that is you've got to come in here and you've got to saw these things off. All right, and the trick is to get them indexed properly. Well, <coughs> what is this angle right here? 90, 90. 90 degrees. Okay. So I could... I can index that like like this if I wanted to with the 90 degree block here, right? Mm -hmm. And I could saw this off. And I could rotate it around and get all of those sawed off until I got over here where that. But it just so happens that if this block is wide enough, it'll register 90 degrees there and I can still saw this off. So I can saw that off. And how do you get it registered? You make yourself a 90 degree block, all right? And you slide it in here, and you slide it in here until it locks on the face, and it, uh, it registers that, that edge there. And then you can slide the block down and rotate it one, and you can slide it again and rotate it one and you can index it all the way around and you end up with an eight-sided tapered leg. And like I said, easy if you know how to do it, right? Yeah, really. <laughs> That's how you add indexing to your jigs to get the rotation you want. And, uh, you know, think about what you have to do because a lot of times you have to make an auxiliary piece that is your reference fence. All right, so we've got a fence here, okay, that establishes this thing, but this establishes the attitude of the workpiece to the blade over here. All right, and if we go back to our original uh, slide there, the things we have to do, we have, have to establish a cut line, which was right here. We have to establish the fence. We have to clamp it down. And now is our sixth element we had to index it. Now, let me let me get to a fun thing here because uh, this is the this is the last example, not the toys, those are the books I want to discuss with somebody else. But many of you have, or you have seen 
these little scrapers. Let's let's go. No, I don't. I don't want to move right now. Anybody got a glue scraper like this? How many? Of you? So a lot of you have these glue scrapers like this, and a lot of you have them made in different configurations. So this is just a paint scraper blade stuck in a little. This I think this is maple. Yeah, stuck in a little maple block, and. I like them this size. I've been using these for years because they just fit in my hand. They just slide in my apron pocket and I've got these laying around the workshop because they're great for scraping off glue. They're great for scraping runs out of finish. If you've got a raw edge on a board that you want to get rid of, all you have to do is run down it like that and you can take that raw edge off. So you want to make your little scraper block like this. Okay. And I mean, we'll make it three inches, just to say your hand is the same as mine, but you can you can make it any length you want to, but let's analyze this, okay? This is the last exercise, but let's analyze what we want to do. We want to take a three inch piece of wood, all right? And we want to drill a hole in it on the center. We can get on the drill press and we can do that with the stop block and we can drill this hole. And we want to make this slot cut right there on the bandsaw and well that's kind of tedious running that up to the bandsaw. It violates the three inch rule. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, what what if it slips off or what if what if you sneeze? Well that's not good. Uh, and then after you get that slot cut in there you want to establish this taper here to clear the blade and then you want to smooth that over. Okay, let's let's move to that slide, uh, Mike, and I'll show you. A scraper taper cutting jig. <laughs> say, say, say that ten times really fast. A scraper taper cutting jig. Alright. What I what I have here is where this little scraper came off of. What I have here is the reasoning you don't want to handle a three inch piece on any kind of power tool, right? So you make it twice as long. You make it six inches long and now you can hold on to it and you can put it up next to the fence. And with six inches long, you can drill a hole in either end of it like this on the drill press using a stop, all right? And now you can go over to the bandsaw and very safely guide that up there and cut the little slot down. And then you need a jig to cut the tapers. You need a scraper taper cutting jig. Right? And the scraper taper cutting jig goes on my 14 inch bandsaw. It looks like this. All right. And if you know it on the picture there, what happened on my picture, Mike? It's there. It's a score. Look, look at that picture there on the right. Is this J? If you put that in there, I have established what? My cut line on the saw. I have now an angled fence. I have a stop block. Okay? And I've got a guide on the saw. And I can I can cut these all day long. Then I can go over to my uh, then I can go over to my table saw and position this and cut it in in two pieces like this. And now I got two little scraper bodies. If I go over to the sander and kind of smooth it up and round the thing off and put a blade in it, I've got a handy little scraper. Okay. Now for you guys that already have these. You're going to have to bear with me and and acquire another one for you guys that don't have them. When you get a jig like this and you get started, it's hard to stop. <laughs> so I, I made everybody one. If you just pass, if you just pass right now. Now, let's go to my last slide, Mike. The jig is up. That's the end of this presentation, guys. Thanks for coming. We've got some good news. Just as we went to that last slide, 
the computer upgraded. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody want to stay and go through this again? <laughs> yeah, Thanks for coming.